Welcome back to Danny Rants today. My guest needs no introduction. He's my most requested guest, and he's aware of that because I told him just about five minutes ago. So today we have none other than Mr. Will Sparks. How are you, my man? DG, very good. good. Back in the homeland, Melbourne, the place where it all started, I guess. It'll you, always be home. You've been back for a couple of days. You've been uh, in, getting back in touch with uh, the home city. That's it, you know, family's still here. Melbourne will always be where the heart is. Uh, it always feels like I'm coming back home because I did move up to Queensland for the last five years just for a change and, you know, I'm so out of the loop here though. Uh, when I do come down, sometimes I'm like, uh, I don't miss it, but I do. More and more lately. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, just family, you know, thinking about long-term stuff and yeah, it means a lot to me, this city, because it really started my career and all the stuff that happened throughout. Uh, I know, I still know every street like the back of my hand and uh, it's always good to get back and see all my mates too. So let's get there. But before we do, let's wind it back, right? Mm. So I don't normally do this with my guests, but for you, I feel like I, the origin story is going to be a bit longer than normal, right? So you're a, what, 17-year-old kid living mm. in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne and you fall in love with a genre that is uniquely made in Melbourne and it, but at that time it was called Melbourne Sound um there's obviously a journey that changes and that takes you around the world but explain to us I guess how you first found out about this genre in Melbourne and how you fell in love with it and how your journey began yeah well my sister worked at Cuba and she had this little Suzuki car with the maddest system in it and I was a heavy metal guitarist I didn't even listen to any sort of electronic music I'm in her car, I'd still remember it, and she started playing some orchestrated record, something off one of those TFU or Wow Wow podcasts. And my whole body, my soul left my body. I felt, I couldn't believe what I was listening to. I lost my shit pretty much. And I was like, this is like nothing I've ever heard before. And I freaked out, I'm like, what is this? And she's like, this is, this is just TFU. This is what they play in the clubs like Cuba where I work and I'm like I've never heard anything like this why isn't this bigger like I didn't understand so I started to go in this like obsessive compulsive search for more of that type of music because I was so into my heavy metal I was obsessed I was what kind of bands were you into like Trivium, Killswitch, Lamb oh, of like God, the proper heavy stuff yeah like and I covered every single song on their albums and this was just a whole another level. It's like I had the same feeling with that music but with this whole new thing but it was electronic. But the thing that got me was the – it was a frequency. It has to be a frequency of that kick, bass, that uh, that toughness of yeah, people, a Melbourne tune. It's like dirty. Like people used to yeah. – that's how we'd explain it. Everyone was like, it's dirty. Thank you. Yeah. I wish I had said that for years because I was always trying to explain what it's like, how it feels but – I do say, if you get it, you get it, you know? I just got goose people saying the word dirty and thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> sure you're just thinking about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it was so new to me and I'm like, I need to know everything about this. And I couldn't find any of the songs because there were DJs around Melbourne producing these songs. That was the only people in the world making this style of music. So I didn't know what to do. I was like, I've got to like make my own because I was – making uh, music on my guitar and I'd make riffs and I could never remember them and I'm like I could even put my riffs onto a MIDI and but that's longer down the track because it took me a while to work out how to use the program and whatnot but um it's so crazy I went down the rabbit hole of all the DJs so I found orchestrated Joel Fletcher Callus I saw this video of Callus playing on a Wow Wow boat cruise or something and he's playing jump and he's just flicking his hand and he's doing his – he's sweating and he does, does this flick and I don't know, there was this vibe. And when he played Jump, that changed my life. I was like, this is everything that I care about right now and I want to be that. And when I started researching everything, Lab 22, Van G, even like people like Fraser Adnam and Samuel James, JDG – they were all popping up and I'm just Facebook f going through everything, following everything. And I worked out 
that uh, well, I followed the Lab 22 page and then I saw Van G was doing a production course. Instantly signed up. Don't know how I got in so easily. I'm like, okay, I'm booked in. It was 200 bucks for the session. Asked, and mum, she was always about doing what I loved. So she paid for that. And I had my first session within that next week. So you're 18 here or are you before you're 18? This is 17. Yep. 16, 16, 17, I think. Around, I, I dropped out of school in year 11. And can you remember what that CD was that got you started? The CD? Yeah. That um, my sister had in the car? Yeah. I think it was Purple Pills by Stevie Mink. Oh, banger. Banger, right? <laughs> and I was like, and then it went to this, it had to be Nightcrawler or something. Yeah. Something with like the dirtiest, filthiest, most heaving bass. And my sister's sub in this little car. It blew my head off. It's cranking. Cranking it. And I was, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, but anyway, so I signed up to the course. He goes, yep, come out to Noble Park, to the studio. I walk in there and I'm freaking out. I'm like fanboying. I walk into the studio and it's quite a, uh, there's a computer there, Van G's, and then there was another one there. Five minutes later, this bloke walks in and goes, hey man, how you going? I'm like, that's callous. So <laughs> I... I went into like this shell shock thing. I couldn't believe I was looking at Callus, and I was shaking. I shook his hand. He was like, "Oh, good, bro. What's going on?" Like just sweet as. And I'm like, "How am I living my dream within? I don't know, three to four months of me being obsessed with this sound. I'm now shaking hands with the people I look up to." I like to paint a picture for Lab Twenty Two that those don't know. Mm -hmm. It was on Jackson's Road. I'm pretty sure in Noble Park. Noble Park. And it was effectively like a little studio next to a milk bar. Yeah. So it was like could didn't get more out of suburban. Then the Lab 22 studio where it was so rough. many massive careers came from. It was rough as, yeah, exactly. So I used to go to that fish and chip shop next door and just get a bag of chips when I ended up eventually working there, right? So when I did the course, uh, Evan Van G said, you know, you've got something going because I was making stuff. I started to make some pretty cool records. Not, they were very low produced, but I was just starting, right? And he goes, well, I think you got something. And because um, I was sending him stuff and he goes, can you work for me? So I ended up actually being the main teacher for his production course. He taught me the criteria, the theory, and I was working there full time within the next couple months. And because I was working there, I was making so much music because I was teaching these kids, people that were way older than me in their thirties. And I was just 16, 17. And uh, I started making all this music and I started creating this big catalog. And the more you make music, the more you kind of work out. And um, that's when I started to get into, you know, Joel and Sammy, they were around sometimes, but I was still so young. Anyway, it sucks I already got to that point in the podcast now because I want to go back to before I did the course. Yep. Right. I went out one night. This is just after I found out about, you know, Callus and everything. I went out one night. It was a school night. I snuck out with my mate to jump room 680 on Glen Ferry Road because you could jump the fence out the back and land in the smokers. It's just it, a random night. It's not there anymore, so you can actually probably explain in detail how you did it. <laughs> okay. There's a car park behind the club and... I think we just jumped on these bins and then lifted ourselves up over the brick wall and you could just jump in and it was there. Two so, stories up. Yeah. Yeah. And we just did it on a random Thursday night and I walk in and I see my good mate Woodsy now because he was the manager there and he's walking around with his earpiece in. He looked like a sh – I just remember him being like a shark. Like you got to avoid him. He's still the same. Yeah, he is. <laughs> the shark. Party shark. Yeah. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> if you know, you know. Uh, and I got in the smokers. I'm wearing like a Tommy Hilfiger vest. I look like such a gimp. And uh, with my mate, we go in. We didn't know what night was on. And I, once you get into the smokers, you got to go straight into the club so you don't get seen by the security guards. I went straight into that side room at room 680 and I look up and Joel Fletcher's playing and Callis together. And I'm like... Where the fuck am I? I couldn't believe I saw them. They were there. It was just meant to be. It's like, God, the universe, something just 
landed me in that place. So when you've jumped the fence, you've had no idea that Noisy Neighbours, which is what it was back at Room 6880, yeah. was on. No. So you've just heard this music, done a little bit of investigation, jumped the fence, these dudes are staring you in the face. Exactly. Wild. It just happened. Like it, I was just, everything that's happened in my life has been such perfect timing. I don't know how or why. Something's looking after me because when I walked in there and I heard that music pumping and that dirty sort of stuff, I couldn't believe it because this is my area. I'm from Camberwell mm. and Glenfrey Road's just down the road. So I thought you could only hear that stuff in like the main clubs in Melbourne. Because that's what I was researching. To that point though, you like other than you jumping that fence, that's the was the truth. Yeah. It was only the underground sort of nightclubs that were playing in, in the city at that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the fact they were out in my way in the burbs. It goes back to timing. Exactly. So do you know what I did? For the next two or three months, I jumped every single Thursday night for no noisy neighbors. And I was underage. I was like 16, 15, 17. And this is before I did the course. But um, that's how I met them. That's how I met everyone. I was I used to sit by myself in the corner of the club just listening to the music and I'd know exactly where to stand to hear the subs perfectly. So I'd stand right in that spot. I wouldn't move all night. I'd just be like admiring. And Samuel James came up to me. He's like, hey, man, you're here every week on your own just standing there. What are you doing? I'm like, dude, I just love all your music. I love everything about what you guys do. I'm, I'm like a big fan. And because he loved that I loved the music, he really gave me the time of day. And then JDG, Jordan, he came into the mix and Joel, I'm trying to remember when I sort of met Joel, but I used to sit out the front of the club, around the front, just to watch Joel walk out with his mates because I loved him so much. I'd watch him walk out with his little swagger, you know, he had a flanny on and his hat. And I used to be like, that guy's the king because, you know, I was obsessed with like bugging device and his track with Geordie, subjected, yeah. these old minimal tunes. And he's killing it too. Like he was, again, he was also young too, but he was like a trailblazer. Jolly. A trailblazer, sorry, trailblazer when yeah. it came to the minimal stuff. Like he was producing high quality stuff with high some quality. of the older guys who were like been doing it for six to ten years. I know. Like Min and Mel got around him and uh, oh, there's so many names that are old now that I forgot, but the minimal heads were all over him because, but he's just a kid from Melbourne as well. And I think he was, just 18 when he was, or even a bit underage maybe. Might have been. He, he was around the traps. Like I actually gave him one of his first gigs and it was funny. So I booked him. He was 16 from HP. Yeah. And um, I booked him on the lineup and then the landline called. So this is how long ago it was. Like the landline in the club called and I answered it and it was his dad. And his dad was basically like, Joel can't play tonight because he's got tape tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then not five minutes later, Joel rolls in. So at that age, I pretty quickly realised that Joel was not, 18. So no. I would have said he would have been playing well before he was 18. Yeah, definitely. yeah, yeah. And he was, I mean, still is such a talent. I, he inspired me with my, like most of my journey and my evolution of music. But yeah, because I was so young, I couldn't get in the clubs and I wasn't close with anyone. And that's when I did the course and then started working for them. So I was in the Noisy Neighbour crew. So with the guys, you know, you obviously you said you were from Campbell, right? Yeah. Like, was that music a thing there? Because like from, I'm like knowing what I know from my club kind of, you know, era, that area would traditionally didn't listen to that style of music. So I remember when you kind of came across, it was sort of like, how, like, where'd you come from? Because most of those people came from like, like South East, you know, out of South East, packing and dancing. You know. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, pop, uh, Caucasian DJs on a Tuesday night. Yeah, right? yep, exactly. That was one of the best nights back in the day. Hey, did you ever go to... Room on a Tuesday? Of course he did. Of course he did. <laughs> You're like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I spent my whole, I don't know, 18, 17, 16, 17 year old years there. Thanks to Jill for letting me in. Um, do you remember Jill? No, I don't know. You don't remember Jill? Huh? No. Oh. If you're listening to this, everyone got past Joff. <laughs> I think he was I think he was blind or something. <laughs> Could, couldn't see the ID. Anyway. To be fair, man, we used to have a guard and we were quiet on nights. So I'd be like, just pretend to look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, get in. Give us in front money. of the CCTV. Yeah, all good. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> it's not our fault. Uh, but I think the coolest thing about my earlier years when I started to create music, I just wanted to be in the Melbourne scene. I was desperate. And I knew I had something because I was making these songs that were like pretty good for me anyway. And then I used to go out to the city 
and catch the Night Rider. Do you remember the Night Rider? Yeah, man. I was talking about it yesterday, funnily enough. Really? Yeah. Well, I used to catch that into the city or and home, obviously, at 4 a.m. But I'd go there by myself or sometimes if a mate wanted to come just to sit out the front of Tramp at 5 a.m. to listen to Joel Fletcher play Bucky Dungun because there were these vents uh, where you could hear the music because it's underground. I'd sit on the gutter just like freaking out hearing it. Even I remember just standing there just like listening. I don't know if I was even dancing, but I was just obsessed, man, so obsessed. And and then I'd sit out the front of Wawa and I'd talk to the security guards and I'd go up to a guy that was leaning against the wall of Waratah Lane because Wawa was like the mecca of Melbourne, the Melbourne sound. And I'm like, do you work here or something? He's like kind of arrogant. He's like, yeah, what's up? Because I was just a kid. I was like, I want to play here one day. And he was just like, sweet, who are you sort of thing. This is Matt LeBon. Ah. Yeah. And he was this, I don't know, real tan, skinny, had his uh, singlet on. Fringe. Fringe. Just yeah. the whole wah look, you know. And uh, I just kept rocking up and I became an, an annoying kid that was in the street asking questions. When can I come in, listen to this, listen to that, giving them CDs to listen to. And that was the SoundCloud days when SoundCloud... I was actually going to ask you this because, like, you know, when you were talking about finding that music, like, where were you finding it? Because back then... There was no SoundCloud. There was forums and stuff like that. So I'm assuming maybe there. That's Melbourne you, Music Forum. Yeah, Melbourne Music Forum. Yeah, yeah, which was yeah. controversial in itself. Is it? A few people have been. Yeah, when it happened at the time, because you know we were obviously leaking we got, music. Yeah, because everyone it was just stuff was getting leaked so often. Um, I had a deal with Heath Renata for Grapevine, the song which no doubt you remember, and we were about to get it re-sang and signed to Bush Records, which is Carl Cox and Eric Powell's huge. record label. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, Heath gave it away on a CD for a lift home back to Chatty. And the kid leaked it on Melbourne Music Forum no. and then it all fell over. But it was – people were trying to – the, the kid who ran it, people were trying to like hunt him down and kill him at the time because that was the – it was like – that was how – it was almost like the explosion of the Melbourne sound but because everyone could get access to it. It became, it became accessible. But it was also at the same time it was like nobody wanted it to happen. At the, and then it turned to SoundCloud and then it was the opposite. Everyone was giving away music for free everywhere. That's it. So I remember leaking music was so bad. Like remember when you'd swap music? Yep. If you had that, I'd swap with that. Remember who killed Mickey or his name at the time, Terry C. I We used to swap music. If you gave me something, I'd give you something. It was literally like a currency. Yeah. And then when Melbourne Music Forum started and something would get leaked, it was like the best thing ever for us kids that wanted it. Uh, but when SoundCloud started, that's what really started my career because then – I started creating some sort of like fan base with that. And then these, uh, and then Matt LeBon ended up giving me a chance. Cause so, why, why was your first gig, set of gigs? That's the next question I was going to ask you. Like, what was your sort of introduction to nightclubs and what clubs did you play? And like, do you have any yarns on them? Yeah. Okay. So, the first ever gig I ever did was thanks to a guy called Geordie Bear. He went to my school and he was right into the Melbourne club scene. He was promoting at Wawa and somewhere else i forget maybe lady luck and uh he wanted to give me a chance and he started his own night it was a club across the road from billboard what's it called it's upstairs uh altitude sin simba it was called simba yeah simba that was my first ever gig and every one of my mates came it was sick there was no one there except for my mates and i remember getting on starting and you know the 1000 mk ones or whatever they were just ruined these decks that was Wes Petit and Heath Renata at the time running that was it yeah no way yeah so he must have promoted for them possibly yeah maybe I don't know but I did not know that was your first gig it was my first gig and then after I played we obviously went out for a bit and at the end of the night Geordie I just remember these so vividly uh this bright red 20 and a bright blue 10 he goes there you go mate that's for (laughs) you that's for your set and I was like what you can get paid for this shit. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to get paid for it. I was just excited to play. When I saw that you could get paid for it, I'm like, wow, okay. That's incredible. 30 bucks back then for me was heaps. That was like a shi- uh, an hour shift at my Woolworths job. So the fact it was just for DJing, I'm like, you're kidding. Um, but yeah, once I did Simba, that's when I was going over to Wawa, annoying Matt LeBon, and he had a, another guy called Stretchy. And Stretchy knew of me and knew of my music from SoundCloud. And he was 
such an open, loving sort of guy. He wanted me in. He wanted me to come in and play with him because he loved my shit. So you were releasing music before you started playing? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I was putting up like Charlie Sheen. That was like the first one I put up. And I had a few songs. I had a remix of Satisfaction. And once I was finally able to club and go into the club, I wasn't playing gigs yet. But I turned 18 and I started straight away at Wawa. I went straight there. And that's when I met Holly J. She was always front dance floor and she'd always DJ there one to two. And I loved her stuff from the Wawa Potomatic stuff. That's how I knew of Holly. And I met her. She was just the most lovely person as well and open and was so happy to hear about and wanted to know about what I was doing. And when she got the Satisfaction remix, she played it one night. And I was there and that was the best feeling I've ever had in my life. Just seeing someone that I sort of look up to play one of my songs out at Wawa. That was a pivotal moment in my journey. Once that happened, I'm like, okay, what's next? And I finally got a gig with Stretchy going back to back every Thursday night at Wawa. And when I started, there was this like, so it's almost like this crew of guys from the West and one of them is called Nick Danev. He is still one of my best mates. So he was one of my first ever fans. And we are still like great friends, which That's is crazy. so cool. Uh, and he got all his mates around us. We got to stay around for the recovery set 4 a.m. or something on a Thursday night uh, for me and Stretchy to go on and go yeah, back to back. And the more we did it each week, we killed it. And these people were just rolling in and all of a sudden – we were pulling more people than probably the main acts at the end of the whole night. And you were pretty quickly playing mostly late nights. Like I know we talked about this before, but I remember right. meeting you with Van G, so I must have been you were working with him at rooms just down the road from room 680, which is crazy because it's the beginning of your story. But yeah. you were ordering a boost juice and they were like, this is Will. I remember thinking you were really tall at the time. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> Still am. <laughs> yeah. But you were pretty quickly playing mostly recoveries because I remember when I – met you down the track i had a different conception of you know what maybe what you were up to because you were playing sort of five to eight a.m all the time like graveyards yeah you were playing all the graveyards and you pretty quickly became a really well-known name in the recovery scene but you weren't necessarily participating in the recovery scene you were just supplying the fucking vibes right so how was that like when you're first cutting your teeth like normally kids start off opening sets and they're putting you on at 6 a.m 5 a.m 7 a.m 8 a.m in the morning how did you deal with that I used to get there at like 11, 12 o'clock and I'd stay there all night until I had to play. I'd be sitting just on the couch with my DJ UDG bag waiting because I was so excited to play. I wouldn't go to – if it was today, I'd go to sleep and then wake up at 4, four o'clock and go in. But uh, I was – my drug was music. I could stay up all night listening to it and I would never got into the drug stuff because I had a few mates that were in the scene and they – just ruined themselves and also a friend said to me if you ever touch ice or g whatever was going around in the club scene at that time i'll never be friends with you and i never did it so good advice from him very and he i have him to thank for that because i probably would have and man you were surrounded by it pretty heavily too like that the times you're playing the clubs you're playing the sound and music yeah it was it would have been hard to avoid especially 18 years old when you're very impressionable so that's Absolutely. kudos to you for that yeah, I'd never had an interest in doing that to myself. Of course, I had a couple of drinks here and there for socialising and I'd get pretty pissed sometimes, yeah. some nights. Uh, but I would never be gacked and I was always focused on playing a good set. So I didn't get caught up in the drug stuff. And I think that's the number one thing for kids these days is you can ruin your career if because this job is surrounded by that. I treated it like a job and a passion and I loved the music so much that I didn't need drugs. And people say to me, oh, I need drugs to listen to your shit. <laughs> well, I don't need drugs to either listen to it or even make it. It's, I just love it. So the next thing is you start making music, right? So you pretty quickly make waves. And I, I don't know how long it took you, but I remember meeting you on Glenferry Road and then quickly hearing remixes and stuff that everyone wanted them. That was like back then, you know, like you said, it was a, a commodity that yeah. people were trying to swap them. Knowing who you were from your songs, connecting that you're the same person and then wanting to book you. Um, so run us through the journey of like how quickly that sort of started and then, you know, the first song that pops off for you. Definitely. 
So I, I got became really good friends with Joel in the end and I used to follow him everywhere to all his gigs. He was getting booked 10 times a weekend or even more. I'd come to every single one and I wasn't booked for anything. And he'd play, he started playing um, my remix of Rack City. That's the one. I was trying to remember, but I couldn't remember what it was. It. Yeah, that was the one I remember. Yeah. I was like, our tramp would come on, everyone knew it. And I was like, like Will Sparks remix, Will Sparks remix. Yeah. And then quick as, like, just like your career started in Melbourne. Like, you know, obviously went worldwide, but it progressed so quick from that Rack City mm. remix. That was it. That was the first song of mine that every DJ in Melbourne was playing from Zach DiPetro to Callis to probably even, um, you know, Heath Renata. But that was the first one when I saw everyone was playing it. Do you remember the little like, it had a little t tune come in and people would know it, dit, 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 dit. And once it started playing, the whole crowd would go crazy. So that was the biggest hit for me to come through in the Melbourne scene. But after that, I just kept making music. I'd live for it every single day. I'd wake up in my mum's house in my bedroom that I grew up in, had this shitty setup in the corner of my room. And the minute I'd open my eyes, I'd be so excited to jump straight on and just do what I was working on the night before or something. I didn't sleep, man. I was up till seven in the morning every night making tunes. Crazy. When I was 18, 19, 20, I'd lived off McDonald's. I had my pea plates. So I'd just go down the road, get a few chicken and cheeses, come back. And, um, but I just remember never sleeping, just sleeping during the day and making music all night. That's what all good producers do, right? Yeah. That's <laughs> where the magic's made in the middle of the night when everyone's sleeping. But these days I'm the complete opposite. I'm like a fitness freak that needs his eight hours and ice baths and saunas. Like, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like that when I first started. Um, but after that, SoundCloud is what really got me going. And then so the biggest hit you had in the Melbourne scene, which kind of bled out to the Australian scene, was Chemical Energy. For sure. And so can you run us through kind of, I guess, making it? And, you know, I will mention that Flea is... Uh, his real name is Alex you, Jones. His real name is Alex Jones, and he is one of the most uh, revered hip hop artists in Australia. A lot of people, from guys like Chillin' It to Husky down to HP Boys, give him credit. He's a pioneer. Uh, he's a pioneer, much the same as yourself. So, can you kind of talk about that link up too? So, what, how Chemical Energy started, what it did to your career, and then the link up, the, the famous link up, infamous link up of Dr. Flea slash Alex Jones and Will Sparks. Yeah, well, so cool that we actually grew up around the same people. We had mutual friends. We used to go down Glenferry Maccas when we were still in high school. That's when we first met. So we all knew the same sort of people. He was from Ivanhoe or something. From And uh, yeah, he ended up being a rapper and I was making music and one of our both, both of us had a best mate that we were both best mates with, Ricky. He linked us up to work together and I sent him a beat, the Chemical Energy beat. And within like, Three days, he sent me back the vocal. Fuck. And I could not believe what we had created. It was that sick because I'm like, I think we were the first people to ever do Aussie hip hop with a Melbourne beat. Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. I I think so. Yeah. I few, few have tried it, people have done it since, but like that was the- Like the an Aussie third, one. Yeah, but it was the first one that didn't get rinsed. Yeah, like people took serious. Okay. So there might've been other ones beforehand that didn't really like, you know, make the cut, but that was the first one people were like, fuck, this, this, this is good. This is dope. Yeah. When he did it, like he's a genius, Flea. And it just matched perfectly, I guess, cause I sent him the timestamps of where to do his verses. And even the weird stuff like, you really hurt my ears, bro. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't meant to be in there. That was him recording. And I used it because he sent me the whole vocal of the recording. He got he did it in one take. He's a skit. Yeah, I've seen him in live. I've seen him do that stuff live. He's a nut. Anyway, uh, we actually did a follow up, and it was even just as good, I think. But like, it was real druggy. Like Chemical Engineer was druggy. He went <laughs> to another level. I was like, bro, I don't think I can say have that. But he would have <laughs> loved it. <laughs> oh, I wish I still had it somewhere in my bank. Um, anyway. Once we did it and it got so big, I was playing at Cloud Nine and I remember playing the song and once it came on, you couldn't actually hear the song on the speakers because people were screaming it. That is the moment, like I've got goosebumps now thinking about it because that is the peak moment of my career, like knowing that I had something huge. And um, when we started playing it live, that's when we started getting paid. I remember I was getting paid $1,000 cash to have Flea perform live with me. 
And without Flea, I was at 500. Uh, but it's crazy going from 50 bucks DJing to 100 bucks that Luke used to give all DJs. Shout out to Luke Dorovic for looking after the young guys that were just there to play, give us 100. And I remember asking, uh, I think Damon Walsh at Wawa, I was like, hey, uh, Damon, I'm getting paid 100 bucks at Billboard, so I want $100 at Wawa. <laughs> and he, he lost his shit. <laughs> he rinsed me for six. Like I was, I, he belittled every part of me. I couldn't believe how strongly he was against me asking for an extra 50 bucks. And then later on, I think he had to pay me 500, like three weeks later. But that was because I gave all my bookings over to Luke who runs Billboard. And he'd just started an agency running it with, I think Joel and Heath were on it. And I asked him to do my bookings and he took them on. And the minute that happened, that's when chemical energy happened. And he just started going thousand bucks. If, if anyone wants them live together and we were getting booked flat out. Yeah, and then you did the uh, yeah thing. So like Straight you, away. You're, so you tell me the timestamps or time period in this, but it's like Rack City, <clears throat> you're playing every recovery in Melbourne. Yeah. Chemical Energy comes out. All of a sudden you become like a, a semi-headliner or if not headliner in the Melbourne scene. Uh, yeah comes out and it hits a new stratosphere, right? So I've got a yarn, which you've, I've told you before, but I remember the first time I knew, every time I saw you, I'd watch you dance around and stuff and there was you, had, you oozed an aura that... I had not seen before. And it was a confidence that it didn't matter if there was five people or there was fucking 5,000 people, you still perform the same. I actually talk about this to lots of people when they ask me about you. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember seeing the moment that I was like, this is going to be fucking huge and we're about to go to the next level was I booked you on a Tuesday night at Orange Whip and you just dropped out, yeah? So this was the next thing. So we may have paid, you know, 500 bucks, 600 bucks. Yeah. So you were still like a headliner fee at the time. Yeah. And there was 800 kids there. So we launched this Tuesday and normally we we're doing like 100, 150. And there was that many kids when you were playing and I remember you, you're doing the Eagle, you're doing all your, your famous <laughs> dance moves. And then um, there was kids physically grabbing onto the booth and they were pulling the plastic off. And we had guards there like trying to stop them from grabbing you. And at that point I was like, that is the best 500 bucks I've ever spent in my life. <laughs> and we never did those numbers again. Never but again. Never again, nah. Like I, th I think it closed three weeks later. And then as soon as you left, all the kids followed you. So, but it was quick. Like, was it, it was a month? It was months, right? It had to have been just months. Yeah. Of making those songs and then performing. I started to perform. When I'd make the music at home, I had this mirror in the corner of my room. And as cringe as it is, I used to jump around in the mirror and do the moves that I was going to do to the song that I just made, which is like whack, but... Nah, but like it ended say, up working. Well, for me watching you, I remember watching him and being like, "Fuck, yeah." He's got, I, he's got some moves. Yeah, right? but I didn't know you were practicing him. Yeah, yeah I was I full practicing. Like I was got, because I get so into the music, I had to dance. I was and just it, sitting there. But it made you stand out. Yeah, and so obviously you were backing up with music, but it was like no one was doing. You common can you? There was a combination of both, but at the same time, it's like from the early days, like playing a tramp. You know, in the morning at seven a.m., there might have been thirty people there still doing that stuff. I was like, okay, it was hard to it was hard to ignore. Even before I Year came out and you went to that next stratosphere, right? For sure. So, yeah, I feel like because Melbourne DJs, they would never jump around and do what Heath I did. Heath did? Yeah, he's oh, probably yeah. the only one, yeah. <laughs> the chest. Oh, far Looked out. like he was going to punch on with the crowd as he was like DJ. Let alone the person he's going back to back with. We'd get so G'd up with me. We'd be like headbutting each other. I loved it. Just sweating all over Dude, each other. I got a yarn. I remember he was like 4 a.m. in the morning. He was playing his club. And I was watching him in this pot glass, like a plastic pot glass, just goes boom, scones him in the head. Oh no. And then he just turns the music down and is like, who the fuck was that? <laughs> he tried to punch out with like the 15 people still left in the club. <laughs> <laughs> See, I believe you, because I've seen him do that before too at Tramp. We were playing together and there was this guy just off his head, just annoying us, kept annoying us. He was got so fed up, he walks around. I just remember him grabbing him so perfectly in the Adam's apple and just put him against the wall. He's like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> and I'm on the decks like, fuck. <laughs> we never want to, he's my bro though. He, he's the absolute OG. You know? Yeah, 100%. Legend. Love him so much. Um, so you make our year and everything changes. You go from a Melbourne institutional DJ, you know, potential headliner at all the local clubs and you blow up, you start playing around Australia, playing around the world. So how, how does that sort of start? How quickly does it go? And, you know, when you made it, did you know it was a banger? I knew it was a banger. I loved it. I was over the moon with it and when i put the teaser up on soundcloud remember we'd put just the teaser come in and fade out uh that's when 
my messages started blowing up needing this record. I had it up for three months before it actually got released. It was the most wanted song I think in Australia. It became in those three months and only I had it. And that's when I started getting booked off just the SoundCloud link. Mm. Like I got my first ever interstate show at HQ in Adelaide off Ah uh, Yeah that wasn't even out yet. And they paid me like 1200 bucks, I think. And I'm pretty sure Tom Ganley made $200,000 that night. <laughs> that's what he told me later on. So that's great. Uh, I've never seen a line that big in my life. It was about five people length and just all the way down Hindley Street or wherever it was. Uh, once it finally got signed by this random label in Sydney. Uh, Do you remember the name? Star, the Starfuckers. Was it oh, Starfuckers? yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't Starfuckers. I don't know who you're talking about. Though, Hookie. Yeah, yeah. No, it was Starfuckers. It was. Yeah. yeah. Their, their label. It was, it was well, oh, yeah, on Starfuckers. Yes. Oh, wow. I and did then, not know that. Yeah, and then it got bought by, I think, Ministry later yeah, of on. Yeah, course, yeah. And that's when the oh, yes, so what came on when Wiley put the vocal on it. But when it got released, there were – David Guetta played it at Ultra and it was in the recorded set. David Guetta fucking played my song, dude. No – and then Layback Luke, Maddie on, and I think they were the biggest – head honchos playing the song and that's when melbourne bounce started to get known around Worldwide. the world and i'm pretty taken back that australia or just like i know the media they don't know anything or they don't really show how much this sound is done yes it's gone across the world and been presented by to millions of people. But not only that, it's uniquely Australian. Like it it's is. something that started here, it grew up in the underground for six, seven years in dingy little basements and was taken by yourself and your peers across the world, played by some of the most reputable DJs in the whole entire world. Hasn't been Celebrated recognized. worldwide. Don't reckon there's been one Herald Sun article about No, it. not one. <laughs> yeah. So like, that's where I'm like, wow, it's, it's incredible that it hasn't been put on a pedestal, uh, if that's the word, but Anyway, I'd... Or celebrate it. Celebrate the term, it. Yeah. Completely. Because it's such an incredible thing that happened just in our city. It's an interesting thing, right? So the reason why I think, obviously, this is what I'm doing. I'm sort of trying That's to That's why I love what you're doing. I appreciate that. Yeah. But it's like a big thing for me is I'm trying to hero our industry because we've always been kind of stuffed in the corner. We're dark. You know, people think of violence. They think of drugs. They think of like uh, a horrible subculture when they think of dance music or nightclubs. And it's just not the reality. And you know? like there's people like you, must, myself and yourself who have changed our lives and changed the trajectory of other people's paths and, you know, you played all around the world and I've got to travel the world doing all this amazing stuff. It's like, yeah, there is this small component of, of something that maybe is distasteful to the media or the wider public, but the, the other side of it is so fucking beautiful. It's a so, beautiful music. And man. that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah, and I'm just trying to showcase that. So. And I love what you're doing, man. And when I saw your videos of you going through the streets and all the knowledge, you are even teaching me things before my time. So, like, it's so cool that it's got a platform now to tell everyone how this started but you know going back to how it went around the world when Dioro got onto our sound and he put his Dutch stuff with it that made it even bigger and his first ever gig was in Melbourne at Billboard correct his first ever gig and then TJR started doing his stuff he also came to Melbourne yeah so I did the tour and I remember he was listening to our tramp in their booth and he was like I need some CDs so the day after he was leaving and I got all these CDs from like Stevie Me, Keith Renata, all those boys, Mike Metro, I just gave them to him. And then we were at the football, this, that trip, right? This is a crazy story, but he did Ode to Oi, as you remember. Yeah. And everyone was yelling. So we're watching Collingwood, Essendon with Lamana. And then he's like, man, it sounds like ACDC, like, Oi, Oi. Comes back, Ode to Oi, fucking first Melbourne Sound song he does. That blows up alongside with, you know, at the same time as Ah uh, Yeah. There's these yep. Dutch elements, America elements, and it just goes fucking mental. And these guys, there's people from overseas who visited Melbourne who made money off it. Yeah, and it's not even just like um, people that lived here and were a part of the subculture. There's people that visited, were inspired by it, had their own trajectory of careers, and they've dominated. You know, like say, so. It's insane. And the biggest, the best part about my job is when people come up to me and say, you've actually changed my life and you've made my life worth living again. Like, does that not like... Bro, but you've inspired so many though. Like, you know, like you went on and did all these amazing things off the back of something that was, again, like we talked about, was something that you, you jumped the fence to listen to. Yeah. And then I reckon per capita, Melbourne has to have the most producers in the world. Like they just have to. Have to. <laughs> we, 
there's so many DJs now in Melbourne and producers coming out of it. There's not enough clubs to cater for everyone. And there will be, like I say it all the time, there'll be other will sparks, like in the sense of different music genres because we feed it. And that's why it's not celebrated, which makes it shit. But it's like we feed it because you were inspired by the people before you, like Orchestrated and Heath Renata, and yep. they were inspired by others before them. And then the people are inspired by you and it continues on and on and on. It's like it's such a healthy culture here. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. And I am so proud to be able to be from here and inspire others, and especially those ones that tell me how I'm their idol. It's like, it's so easy for me to just uh, acknowledge them too, because all I ever wanted as a kid was to talk to my idols and for get sure. advice. So From humble I, beginnings. Yeah, so if I ever meet someone on the street or, and I'm so happy to talk to them about anything that they want. And, uh, but yeah, the fact that my music, which is high energy, high adrenaline, people are telling me I saved them that's enough for me to be like I did enough in this world and I'll continue to go yeah keep going so Aya goes out blows up around the world you go from playing clubs and then you start traveling the world circuit right so run us through like how that happened you know your first interstate international gig and then like how you dealt with it and no one had run that path yet so no what you couldn't you know lean to someone and say hey you know when you did this what it looked like you had to do it yourself definitely I had to learn everything as I went and same with Luke my manager we went to Hong Kong, first ever international show. It was pretty random, you know, at a bottle service club. But it was fun. It was, everything was really exciting because it was all new. I didn't realize what I was in for for the next 12, 13 years now because it is tough. It is rough, especially those shows that are back to back to back in different cities, different countries. Like I do, I think it was 180 to, 100, to 200 flights a year. And people always ask me, how do you do it? And I have to just say, look, the human body is able to move from A to B. That's it. I don't see anything, Yeah. really. I just go and I have to be awake. The amount of times I've had to wake up after napping or something, you know what it's like, a disco nap, and then go and play and come home and then get another two hours to catch the next flight, which is at 7 a.m. But when I first started touring the world, I, we did this Europe tour as well. And Luke and I would, like Luke did three months with me to start and we worked a few things out and we found a tour manager who was like an agent at the same time that was bad but we got some shows done real dingy dude i was playing in every corner of every country town in europe in italy to france and all these random places i think that was a good experience like because i got to see the weird rural spots around the world anyway <laughs> i had to stay in some rough joints one and that's a good thing to kind of touch on right like you know we're watching from melbourne going fuck we was traveling the world but we shit holes. yeah we don't know that you're staying in two star mo uh, motels like, and that's the beginning right like even even though everything's looks so glorious from maybe the outside no i couldn't afford shit i had two flights to pay so me and the tour manager and uh all these hotels which were the shit of shit hotels that's the only way i could get by especially in America because it was really expensive and I didn't realize how expensive it is to be a touring artist. So for those listening at home, I may get a fee of this, but I probably end up getting about 15, 20% of it after all expenses. This doesn't, and it depends on how many people you have on your team, your wages, everything else, what flight costs are to make it in time for that show because some flights are more expensive than others, but you have to get that flight to make it. Do you yeah. mind breaking that down, right? Because it's a thing, again, going back to like talking about when things look glamorous and then potentially not. So say like for argument's sake, let's talk off 10,000, right? Which I know is not your favor. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take off 10,000. People would look at that and go, oh, wow, Will gets the whole amount. But when, what are the actual costs that break down when you are touring and cha challenging that ends up seeing you, with, that you end up seeing the 15 or 20% out of? Okay. So industry standard. 10 to 15 percent is agency depending on your deal and then 10 to 20 percent is your management commission depending on your deal so if you had the shit of both which is 20 plus 15 which is what i was on at the start too everybody because, is yeah because when you first start you're getting a shitty fee they, it needs to be worthwhile for the manager and agency to be working with you because they need some money to keep going so that's 35 percent straight off the the froth of the top so whatever that is, off 10 grand, um, 75. Three and a half thousand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
why I'm a DJ and not a mathematician. Every um, time we have these conversations with numbers, with uh, artists or promoters and stuff. Six and a half grand. It's left over, yeah, yeah. Six and a half grand left over. So, yeah. And then you have to pay for your flights, whatever they are, let's say. Because most deals are landed, which means that Will has to be at that place. They don't want to pay for transfers. They don't want to pay for accommodation. I pay for transfers. I pay for flights, a comm. So, or some, no. Not always, but yeah. A comm's usually covered for the one night not for the week that we're staying there if it's interstate or international. Uh, so, yeah, 1000 bucks, I guess, off flights. They're probably 500 for two people. And then that's what I'm left with. But that's... General, general expenses, I'm assuming. You've probably got, like, legal and accounting fees. There's all, all kinds of Oh, there's stuff. so much more that comes into it. So business managers, bank managers. Business managers have to, uh, you know, pay all your people, get invoice all the clubs, make sure the money comes in. And then they get paid as well for their work. Uh, what else? Videographers, photographers. Yeah, well, let's keep going then because that's where I'm at now. So videographers, lighting, audio technicians, um, tour manager, logistic, people that do the logistics. So I actually book my flights and accommodations, the routings. Uh, I'm lucky to only have two guys on my team who have about 10 jobs, Vinny, Cogliandro and Cam Lights from Adelaide. He does all the visual and audio while I'm playing on the show and he does the time coding of the lights and Vinny does, wow, he does pretty much everything from photography to editing to social media to, God, just my day-to-day -day schedule, even content for brand deals and he films them and edits them and he talks to the people that do logistics to tell them that we want these flights and these hotels so he's tour managing as well and when we're touring on the road he's the one looking at the flights where we're going i'm just like strutting being, being the creative yeah so they're on wages and you know they're doing well so i mean it, it is, takes a village it yeah it takes a lot and um there's so much behind the scenes with the management company and this is I don't want this to bore people, but yeah, you get to about 20% of what you earn of that 10 grand for the year, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I, I always like try to press on this stuff because I want to show, you know, all sides, right? Mm. And then it kind of goes back to this other thing. You're, you're traveling around in Europe and you're staying in these shit hotels. No one really knows because you're working on a budget because you're trying to build your brand. That's it. It's no different than any other business, right? Lost um, money over and over again too. And so what, was it challenging and like isolating when you were doing that? Like when you were on the come up? Like obviously now, no doubt you can afford better accommodations and flights. Yeah, and yeah, things. yeah. I still do skimp out sometimes because end of the day we're doing it so much so i can't fly business all the time because i do 200 flights a year if i did business every time i'd be well broke yeah so it was disheartening because i'm like man i'm doing so well apparently you know why am i not getting paid like i remember the managers got paid more than me one one tour and i was like what the fuck and luckily because luke and neil at the time they were good people and they paid me some out of their cut so I was still able to live, you know. So Wild, it's, hey. It's crazy. Like, yeah. I was so lucky to have such good people around. And thanks to Neil, he got me out of the Ultra deal, which I was in for. So I signed a deal to Ultra Music and they didn't want to release my music because it wasn't commercial enough. And that was a million dollar deal. For me to get out of that, I had to pay a million. Wow. But in America, there's always someone that owes someone something and I got out of that. Thanks to Neil, who was good friends with him and he owed him a favour. I guess I can say it now, but I was so lucky not to sign a long-term deal, even when I did. <laughs> Went off track there. Yeah, but uh, what do they call the word? It's like, um, I can't remember what they call it, but they they it's, they closet you or there's some term they use. Where they give you a big advance fee. It's like, here, have a hundred grand and then we'll do 17 albums and you'll get a million dollars after those 10 albums or whatever. And but it's not unusual that they'll have an artist that blows up, they'll use them and then they go, no, we don't like this music and they leave them in the deal and just put them, put them aside. I can't right. remember what the actual term is. Shelving is the term. There we go. Shelving? Yeah, shelving. There's a different term than shelving in or Melbourne. Or shafting. No, shelving, shaft, probably both. Yeah, you're getting <laughs> shafted. So. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> oh, I just feel for those people that are locked into those deals because what they do is they go, yep, let's, here's all the money and then they'll go, no, we don't like that. No, we don't like that. And you're like, mate, I just spent two weeks making this record. I love it. We have to release it. No, we're 
not. Yeah. Not for us. They're trying to get back their money that, that they've given you in that advance. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's a sad, sad industry sometimes because be. young kids get taken advantage of. And I've got a really good yarn, as you'd say. When I first, when I released Ah oh, Yeah, Chris Lake hit me up and he goes, yo, love your music. I love what you're doing. I'm pretty sure TJR hooked me up with him somehow, got my details. It was on Skype. This is how long ago this was. He goes, we need, let's do a Skype call. I work for, I think it was the agency that run, uh, does Dead Mouse. What is it? 360? Yep. 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 CEO of 360 and me and Chris Lake had a call. I was like, wow, what's this about? Got on the call and I answered and <laughs> such a young Aussie idiot. I had my shirt off. I was in my bedroom with my shirt off because mum never put the aircon on. It was the middle of summer in Australia. And I'm sitting there shirtless, man, like, g'day guys, how you going? <laughs> like so innocent. They're like, wow, you don't even have a shirt on. I was like, oh yeah, I don't know. Like, thinking back, like, what was I doing? I'm meeting up with like some of the biggest heads in the industry. And they're like, love your song, oh yeah. We're going to make it is the biggest thing in the world. And I'm like, okay. So they're throwing some stuff out there saying it's going to be amazing and i knew it was sick but we need you to be our artist we want to manage you i was like okay what's the deal then they're like oh easy 50 50 split we take 50 percent management fee wow yeah and i was 18 at the time and i went that seems pretty you know that's that's a bit much and he was like oh well let's make it 60 40 then because he just easily switched like that i went that's it doesn't seem right it doesn't seem right i can smell a rat and i said all good guys i don't i don't want to i think i just hung up and said i'd speak to them i spoke to luke and how's this luke was like i want you to have the best career if you want to move on with them that's fine that's crazy and when luke said that to me i was like you have every part of my trust and i haven't left luke since yep 14 years on which is very rare yeah, this is very rare. So we've been together since day dot. I could have made that horrible deal, which would have been the same as Avicii's on 50% with Ash, Preneuri. And um, it depends on what they would have provided. Maybe they would have made my career bigger than what it is. I don't know. But I'm so happy and content where I am. And I just think 50% was way too much and getting taken advantage of. Yeah. So you talk about all these challenges, man, which I love, right? We're talking about, you know, normally there's this whole story of how you started and how fantastic and awesome it is, which we're going to get to. But this is, we're going through these challenges that people don't know, right? And I fucking love that we're opening that door and mm -hmm. we're exposing people who are probably looking up to, you know, wanting to live that lifestyle. There's one other one I want to touch on too before we get into the, the fun stuff, right? So you've gone over to Europe and you're traveling. And what happened in Melbourne, and it's just an Australian thing, which is called Tall Poppy. And I remember this pretty profusely. And I was actually talking to James Favor not just the other day, right? Which is Dom Dole's manager for yeah, those yeah, that yeah. don't know. Yeah. And we were discussing you off the topic of this Tall Poppy thing. But basically what had happened is you've gone blown up around the world, you know, and there was people who were stoked for you. There were so many people who were stoked for you. But at the same time, I would almost say there was just, as ma just the same amount of people who were not stoked for you. Mm -hmm. So you probably, in my opinion, which is something that we've never discussed before, but you dealt with Tall Poppy probably worse than anybody that I've seen or had seen at the time. H how was that for you? Like, and it wasn't just from like your peers, it was also from some, you know, just random people you might've known or your community or whatever. Like, how did you deal with that? Yeah, I got, I got heckled pretty bad. I got some bad hate and I remember it happening. The way I put it is thinking back to those moments where I'd get so much hate online, I genuinely thought they just didn't get it. And I was like, well, everyone's got their own you know, I don't love everything either. But I didn't realize at the time that they were just projecting their own hatred. True, jealousy, yeah. Jealousy. And like, if you don't like something, just don't say anything at all. That's how I've been brought up. Always have respect no matter what. And it's on you the way you react. So I dealt with it fine. It did get to me. I remember Stony Rhodes did some pretty terrible articles about me, which is sad because they're a legitimate music publication were back then yeah Yeah. so it was really tough to handle and navigate and i'd have rage moments and i had people telling me to kill myself and this one guy said on a facebook post please do us all a favor and kill yourself so we don't have to uh, listen to your shit ever again and my sister 
went on his profile, found out where he worked, showed his work, the comment, and he got fired. Good. Yeah. So I guess that was lesson learned for him and for anyone at home that wants to put something out there online because you're in the public. People know where you are and know where you work if you put stuff up like that. So, yeah, I copped it pretty bad. And on the Tall Poppy thing, I remember I won the In The Mix Awards. And I think Quick. it was it. Hey? Quick. Because it was like the thing that happened with you is everything was quick. It was, yeah. like, it was like bomb after bang, bomb bang, after. Bang, bang, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was all like happening so quickly. Uh, but looking back, I'm so proud of myself as that young kid getting up on a stage and speaking out about tall poppy syndrome. I'm pretty sure it was – what was that? Uh, it was during In The Mix. It was a conference. Um, it still goes on now. The music conference, it's like electronic music conference. This EMC. EMC. Does yep. it still go on? I, I no, nah, it's, it's stopped. Yeah. And uh, I got up at the conference and did a speech about Tall Poppy. I'm, it was either then or in the mix. Anyway, whatever. When I did it, I remember Nick Coleman in the crowd jumped up and said, fuck yeah. I was like, oh my God, that's really, there's like something real. I hit a nerve there with him. He's dealt with it too. And I kept going on in this speech. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I was like, hey, we're all friends. We're all mates. Why don't we all build each other up? This is Australia. We're known to be the, the small guys in the corner, but we're the most talented. So if we all build each other up and celebrate our, our craft and get around each other, we're a fucking powerhouse. Because we, I just didn't get why we'd want to bring each other down. And so yeah. I really voiced that in that speech I did off the bat. Like I didn't prepare it or anything. And so I don't know, maybe after that, that's when our genres weren't, we weren't hating each other because genres used to hate each other. They did, yeah. They were separated. They were. But not even that, promoters, clubs, like it was, it was a thing. Mm. It's getting less bad, but people, people still will try to rip you down. Like, you know, I've had some incidents recently myself. But really? Yeah, it's, it's shit go, but it is what it is. But it's getting fewer and further between, definitely. Like you were at that peak of it. Like, cause it was like the internet just blown up. Yeah. You know, you were the first really successful in, international artist from Australia. You know, five years beforehand, no one would have access to tell you to kill yourself online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, all of a sudden they could, yeah. And so yeah. you was you were really kind of thrown thrust into the in the deep end. But at the same time, I had a bit of a staunch outlook as well. I'd be like, I don't give a fuck. Come on, come say it to my face. I'd actually get into some pretty heated I remember. You do? <laughs> <laughs> I'd staunch people in person because they'd say it online and this one night, uh, I still remember his name, Peter. Peter was his name and he was rinsing me on the hour with Facebook statuses. And I was playing at Alex Milanovic's Hidden Forest and downstairs was where I was playing and Peter was playing upstairs at the same time. And uh, we got there just before I was meant to go on and Peter already started and I went in and downstairs was so packed you couldn't even get in. It was flooding out the door. And then the stairs to go upstairs were there. So I went up the stairs to go have a look at Peter's level. Uh, two people on the dance floor. I don't even think there was a bartender up in the bar. It was that dead. And he's just sitting, standing there playing tunes. And um, I went straight over to him and had a little confrontation. Conversation? Conversation. And I actually gave him a black eye, but we won't probably put that in. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was playing with Bo Johnson and, yeah, Bo split us up. I just said, you ever say another thing, whatever. I stood up for myself, you, you know? Should, yeah. And it's not good to get violent, but I needed to stand some sort of ground. And then I went back downstairs and played to a thousand people and ripped the ass out of it. So. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's a good moral of the story. People talk. Mm. And the people talk that day with their feet. And exactly. So if you want to say something, you better be able to back it up in person. Yeah. So then the good stuff, right? Yeah. You, you, you go around the world, you, you're traveling, you're doing all this amazing stuff. Just tell us some peak moments, like some peak moments of your career thus far where you've just sat there and gone, what the actual fuck? <laughs> well, I played to 50,000 people in, or might have been 80 in Mexico, EDC. That was early on. That was in Melbourne Bounce was peaking. Like, oh yeah, I was playing and... That was a pinch myself moment. Then I was playing in America, this place near Seattle. It's like these little visions that come back to me of me thinking, how the fuck did I get here? Sometimes even today, I'll look down at the decks, they're playing, it's just, and there's that cue button. 
and I'm playing in front of 50,000 people and I think to myself while I'm playing, I'm like, I could just click that cue and fuck everything up. <laughs> I could just, that's it. It's like the moment when, you, like when you're driving, you just go, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Just ruin and just kill yourself. <laughs> it's terrible <laughs> to think like that. <laughs> but they're the pinch yourself moments when you're playing a brand new song and you've killed the mix and you see the wave just going like that. But these are all things I already thought about when I was 15, 16 in my bed at night listening to music in my headphones pretending that I was playing in front of thousands of people. I did it every single night because back then we didn't have Netflix. and I mean we had other crap like video games but I didn't like playing video games. I liked to imagine things because I'd get the same thrill inside when I'd, when I'd think about it. So I'd play one of my favourite songs, close my eyes, pretend they're all in front of me and I didn't sleep. I couldn't sleep for like five hours because – I had all this adrenaline pumping through me imagining it. So I think if you imagine things, they become reality if you really feel the way it feels like in your head. And does it? Yeah. It feels exactly the same. Exact same. Fuck, that's exact crazy. Exact same. So tonight, go in. I don't know if I'm going to get the chance to play in front of 50,000 people to compare <laughs> though. <laughs> if, you, if you just imagine it, it's the same. Yeah. But – yeah, obviously when you're actually doing it, it's just another level. And is it daunting? Like, are you nervous? Like, you know, I've seen some of these things that happen and you're playing in front of them and you're jumping around, you're putting on this massive show. Are you nervous? Not at all. That's no. wild to me. I am I am the most confident performer I've ever met. I walk up there, especially when you know you you got something good and you go, welcome. Come watch it. Come watch me kill it for you. And I think that confidence really got me through to where I am because there's no doubts. I'm always like coming to the table with something new, different to anyone else on that lineup. And I know I'm going to bring as much energy as possible because I was always the kid that was had the most endurance in cross country. I was the, I don't know, in, in footy, I'd always Didn't go do the, things in halves. I'd go the hardest. I would be at 100% with everything I did. So even with performing, it takes a lot of energy. And I know that my energy is going to surpass anyone, probably bar Timmy Trumpet. He's a lunatic when it comes to his energy. But um, I know I can put on a show. And if you have any doubts, you're already going backwards. You have to be 100% with everything you do. And that's why even with music, I'd put stuff up. People get worried about putting things out. I'm like, just put it out. And they're like, oh, I don't know if it's any good. And I'm like, well, make it good. Make it <laughs> to what you think is the best because if you love it, then someone else is going to love it. That's how I always used to think. Yeah, wild. Mm. That's so cool. So, and then, so that, your favorite gig would be that EDC that you played in Mexico? No, definitely not. Uh, favorite gig? It's so hard to say. There's so many, but I get really euphoric moments at EOS in Far at Far Out Beach Club. I always mention it, especially when the sun's coming down. Everyone's just on a high. You're on a Greek island. That's the best. I had some pretty big nights at Paradise Club in Mykonos back in the day. It's no longer around, but dude, my peak moments were probably like tramp and circus. And no shit. Wow, wow, upstairs. Nothing beats that. Yeah. Because it was fresh, it was new. Special. Special. I, I mean, I guess it was when I first started out. So, because now I've done it so long, I'm not over it in a sense, but it drags on sometimes. I'm, I'm usually looking forward to getting home. Yeah. Like I really struggle on the road sometimes mentally because I'm alone. I don't have much of a community. I got my two guys and they struggle too. And we, during the week from Monday to Friday, I'm not talking to anybody. I'm not seeing anybody. I'm on my own. I'm waking up and going down the street to the gym, wherever, cooking my meals, coming home, going back to bed. And it's that dead time, right? Like you're just sitting in a hotel, either waiting for a bus or getting dropped off by a bus, chilling out, just waiting for the next movement. Yeah, and I'm trying to fill my day up. And luckily producing really fills your day up if you're on. Like I haven't touched the the music for about a month, six mu uh, six weeks now because I just don't have that drive. And then it goes through waves and then one week I'll make five records in a week and I'll finish them and I'll play them that weekend. Lucky when I played at Perukaville, probably one of the best gigs too. Perukaville this year, I didn't have much new stuff and because i was under pressure i'm like fuck i gotta make some new shit for this set because getting recorded live stream 
I made five records in that week. So that was that was lucky. So where's your studio? Like, you know, I know you're traveling around the world all the time. You're writing music all the time. Where is this studio? It's a laptop. A laptop. And a pair of Beats mixers, mix, mixers by Goetta, who, which got discontinued about 10 years ago and I keep buying them on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> I can't change. And just hotel rooms or like, where, where are you writing? Kitchen, hotel room, just a lounge room. That's crazy. On the couch. So some of your in biggest, a plane. So some of your biggest songs have been written in those places? My biggest songs have been written on a plane like T-Rex like this with old mate next to me drooling on my shoulder on overnight flights, you know? That's mad. Yeah, dude. That is so cool. You don't need a big you – know, you can do it with the bare minimum. I do sometimes get help by engineers when it comes to mixing down. I get it nearly there and most of the time I do just – master and mix myself but when it's like i can't get it there i send it off to some guys and they're awesome helping me crazy tour story can you hit me with one so i was in sweden in a really random little city town and i played this gig and i ended up getting bastard that night like i was on one. <laughs> oh yeah i was steaming and got to about 6 a.m and i'm in the apartment like the hotel and I put my feet up on this uh, this heater, like a steam heater off the wall because it's so cold there. And I remember it just like broke off and just started hanging off the wall. I'm like, oh, whatever. I'm still like just off my head talking to people on FaceTime. And then I had a glass of red wine and I spilt it all over my computer, which wasn't backed up. And I'm like, oh, what? Oh, whatever. It'll be all right. Tipped it upside down. I just left it there. That's when I thought it's time to call it, right? Went to bed and had to wake up about two hours later to get to the next city. Yuck. Grim times. Grim Ugh. as. Yeah, demons. <laughs> and I, I get out of bed. I'm like, I got to go. Take one step out of the bed and my ankle was in water. It was this high in my hotel room. The whole thing was flooded. And I'm freaking out. I'm like, what the f How did this happen? I'm looking out the window. The window's open. I'm like, is it raining or something? Like, stupid. I didn't realise that that heater had a pipe attached to it and it was filling up my whole hotel room. Kidding. Yeah, dude. So I got out of there. I freaked out. I didn't tell anyone. I should have told someone. But I didn't. I left it like that. So <laughs> I ended up ruining four hotel rooms below me. What? <laughs> because it just kept going i booted to the next city we got a call and they said you've ruined our hotel and i did about three hundred thousand euros worth of damage Fuck. and my i lost everything on my computer as well in the same day because of the red wine spill what was worse don't know <laughs> <laughs> but thank god i had travel insurance that covered most of it that's a wild story. But dude. guess what? The best part is I'm not allowed within 10 kilometers of that hotel. Yeah, so wow. So I've played at shows in cities nearby and I wasn't allowed to stay there. I had to drive out of it. So, so what, forever? Yeah. Forever ban. <laughs> On that, right? You're talking about uh, controversial tour moments, but there was recently one where you were playing at a festival. You were straight after Hardwell. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, there was a big controversy that kind of like, you know, went viral online. Can you run us through that story and what it was like sort of following that up, being the artist after that moment? That was a, that was a G up, to be honest, because when I saw that happen, one, I was pretty upset for Robert because he was obviously not happy. But on the other hand, I was like, well, I'm here to save the day. I was like, I'm going to save this fucking shit. So I went over to the production managers and the stage managers and I'm like, team meeting i didn't even know them like everyone come in i was like are we gonna fucking kill this and save the day or are we just gonna turn over and lie down and just let it go because he cracked it 20 minutes in i wasn't on for another 40 minutes yeah half the crowd had left and so i was like let's give these people what they paid money for so so there's a full 40 minute gap mm. oh wow but i got on i think only 20 minutes later and yeah played the extra and I ended up smashing it and not a single problem for me because they fixed the problem. And that was like the day saved. But it was funny, I, I spoke to Hardwell straight after it all happened. And he was kind of, he was calm. He was like, what the fuck, man, this place, like, they just, they couldn't, 
work it out. And I was like, oh, okay. And that's when I went up and yeah, it, I feel, I don't know, because they mentioned my name in their, what, their statement. Yeah, they did, yeah. Yeah, and they were like, nothing was wrong for Will Sparks. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not, on, that's not on hardware. It's just the fact they changed the mixer and it was all sweet. So when something like that happens in live music, you have to just improvise. And it happened at Ultra Music Melbourne recently. Someone threw a massive uh, can of whatever. Someone threw a drink onto the front of house touchscreen audio system yep. and it stuffed everything up and stopped the music. So what did I do? I got up on the mic, I came out the front and I started doing a big speech, geeing up Melbourne, how this is the mecca, how it all started here. And I did that for five minutes while they fixed everything up and I let the stage managers do their thing and I'm I'm on the mic geeing people up and then I'm going like this to them going, is it ready? Are we good? Are we going to do this? And then sort of doing two things at once and that's what real showmanship is, showing up, saving the day if anything goes wrong because things happen. And people it's, are paid to see you too, right? Exactly. And these tech guys, they can't control everything. Sometimes things just fuck up. And you got to be the professional about it and go, yeah, but I guess there's been some long-term things that happened with Hardwell's situation. They didn't pay him and they hadn't paid him before and so he's fed up. Yeah, I get it. But this is ultra music and I want to get on the main stage in Miami. Yeah. Please. <laughs> if you're listening. Yes. Uh. <laughs> First festival you played in Melbourne, I was lucky enough to be able to uh, come along and it was by default. So I'd actually been bannering the day before at a festival called You Vans went all Walk. the way through. Nah, I had a little bit of sleep but not much. And I went and met you guys at Crown and then I was taken away in a limo. So my first real backstage, um, not experience, I've been backstage a million times, but like with an artist was with you. And I remember it was fucking crazy to me because again, you were from this, this kid from Melbourne. You were being managed by one of my best mates at the time. And we jumped in the car. We got to go, you know, whisk to Stereo Sonic. They took us to the back area. And the crazy part was we were always told to stay away from the artist areas when we had backstage passes. So yeah, we could watch people from the side of stage, but I got to be involved in that. For you, right, growing up and watching these guys on this world stage, like how fucking crazy was that for you being next to, you know, David Guetta or calling Hardwell Robert? Like how has that been meeting your idols? It's, it's been surprising how nice and open and cool they are. Like Tiesto, Calvin Harris, they've all been so open. And same with Armin Van Buren. He's always asking about how you're going with your mental health. Like he's a big advocate of that for DJs behind the scenes. Like he doesn't tell everyone about it. And that was, that's the coolest thing, going in, having a shot with Tiesto. These are moments I'll never forget. And just having honest, normal conversations because they're all human just like us. Yeah. Uh, but, and yeah, I guess that shows that most successful people are pretty good people, you know. Yeah. Uh, but getting the treatment back, especially in my home city, is funny because I'm from here. So I think at the start, Stereo and Future were like, Who's this guy? He's just from Melbourne, you know. We don't have to give him towels on his stage sort of thing. <laughs> I reckon I'd be guilty of that too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, he's from Melbourne. We're not, right. not giving him a car. He can drive his mum's, you know. <laughs> anyway, I've, I've had a few of those moments but most of the time it's been – like when I played Stereosonic the first time, I got booked in the side stage going back to back with Samuel James and I said to Luke, I'm like, they don't understand. This little room is going to be jammed. There's going to be way more people that want to come in. I was right. It turned out that there was 5,000 people trying to get into this tiny room side stage at Stereo because it only held like a couple hundred people. And I went outside and there was this big stage next to me, no one there, and some guy playing from Germany or some shit. So these are all the times I had to prove myself yeah, to. Yeah, and you did a lot, yeah. Yeah, I, I got booked at room as headline in the side room. I ended up having to get airlifted by people like security guards actually held me up and carried me from the side room to the main stage because people were trying too hard to jump into the side room happened at jane's bar billboard so there's all these times where i've had to yeah prove that i'm worthy of a good time slot yeah for sure and i remember even again it was future music so we used to have down the back we call there's the loud bowl but it was like the little amphitheater off the back of the stage at summer days or future music mm. and it cleared out <laughs> and i was like where the fuck did the crowd go so I started like following people and you were playing like above like this foam pit 
I'm like in front of a car. <laughs> and I, reckon, I remember that. I reckon there was 5,000 kids. And at the time Snoop Dogg was on and there was more people, I reckon, watching you than what? there was Snoop Dogg. You're kidding. I swear, I mean, all I remember is like, what the fuck? And you were just like, put up above this car in this like little Red Bull stage thing. And there was just swarms of people everywhere. No but way. They're the coolest moments though. Like from all the artists that I've got to see blow up from Dom, Fisher, all these different artists yourself. It's like the best part is that bit. Yeah, and like yeah. when they are like earning their stripes and yeah. they book for a show and people think they're worth this, but they're, they're, they can bring double the amount of people and stuff. Like I'd say they're some of the biggest highlights from in my career is watching those explosions because it's fucking exciting. It is. And they're the moments that you have to go through to get to where you are. You just have to earn your stripes, as you said. Yeah. I don't normally do this, but I have to with you because as I said, you're one of my most requested guests and no doubt people want me to ask these questions. So normally um, I don't do this because it's more of like an Intel thing, but for up and comers who are trying to like change the face of a genre or, you know, be a part of an industry or do something different, do something different or be a trailblazer, fuck me, Danny, or be a trailblazer. What's some advice from you to them? But someone who's done it. Yeah. Uh, okay. This is a good one and I'm glad you asked that question. Close your eyes and imagine you're in the middle of a dance floor at your favourite festival in the world, even if you haven't been there, if it's Tomorrowland, and just think, what would you want to hear? And that's what I've always done. I've gone, what do I want to hear? What do I want? And I actually make the song up in my head before I make it. So I don't listen to anyone else's music. I don't try to be anyone else. As far... I'll only go as far as comparing quality of sound. But to be unique, you just have to be yourself. My real name is Will Sparks. Which is wild to me. <laughs> it's wild to a lot of people. Best stage name. <laughs> See, it just was it. I was I didn't need to think I didn't too hard. I didn't need to force anything. Don't force it. And at the same time, don't give a fuck. Who gives a shit what anyone thinks? And I know it's easier said than done, but you don't have to take advice from Joe Blow down the road about your music that you've just started making. Work hard at it, be obsessed with it. Be as particular as you possibly can to make it just perfect and just right for you. You do not need to please anybody. I had my, I used to make music at my mum's room and she would come in going, this sounds like shit. What is that sound? It sounds like it's off the radio, Will. What is that? It hurts my ears. And I go, Mom, you don't give it, you don't know what you're talking about. This is the sickest shit gone. So just back yourself is what I'm saying. And don't be like anyone else. You are who you are and you are unique to you. That's why you are born on this earth. So that's it. Stand out. And once you get those few people that like what you're doing, snowball. Don't force it. Just make it. And you will make it and believe. If you don't believe, you're nothing. If you want to go back to your day job, that's what you believe you're all worthy of, then you're going to be worthy of that. I love it, man. Thank you. It's so good. And I, and I hope people get, you know, what they can live one-tenth of what you've done and by following some of that advice. And it's completely inspiring to see your journey from the sidelines. You know, like being a part of it has been a blessing. Uh, and also it's been fucking humbling to watch you grow as a person too and you know, full swing come back and sit across from me. Thank you. Yeah, it's been amazing to see how far you've come as well. We've known each other a long time and um, it's crazy we're sitting here talking about everything but I'm so proud of what you do and what we've done and uh, Melbourne is always the place. How good's fucking Melbourne? It's so good, dude. <laughs> you don't get it. If you weren't here for Lady Luck on a Thursday, Friday night? Friday, yeah. Or tr Fake Tits, Dan Danny's Night. On a Friday as well. It was also on Friday, yeah. Or dr Jungle on a Sunday morning or Wawa Saturday night upstairs or Jane's Bar on a Saturday. Like there's so – Corova 6 a.m. I used to walk out of that place at 9 a.m. and I'd never regretted a single time. Disgustingly beautiful. Disgusting. Yeah. Oh, bright daylight crust. So lastly, a little bit of housekeeping, Will. I've got to do this obviously because without these brands and these people supporting me, I didn't get to keep the lights on. So firstly – WP Shots, available at Liquorland, first choice, and all good independents around Australia, and that's for you, Will, so you get to keep that one. Really? Yep. Oh, I haven't had a wet pussy shot since 2011. <laughs> They're Beautiful. back in flavour. And then second to that is Estilio, the label. 
These boys are actually local promoters. So Borsch is one of them. No doubt you know him. Hey, Borsch. Get around them. The quality of their threads is fucking unbelievable. I can guarantee you if you buy a t-shirt and you don't like it, I'll give you your money back. That's how much I back it. Last but not least, AAA Digital. If you're looking to upscale your events or hero your festivals or hospitality business, Carlo from Lab22, old Mr. Paduano, he is your man to do so. He's got great track record and gets great results. So go check them out at AAADigital.com.au. Dude. Carlo P. Carlo P, baby. He, he is one of the OGs as well. Shout out to Carlo P. He was there in the trenches when I was very, very young too. He was the so. booker when you were sort of cutting your teeth, right? And he was the nicest guy in that whole complex. Still is, I reckon. And so I have a lot of time and uh, respect for what he used to do for me back in the day, yeah. He's a good he's a good friend of mine and a great, like, great person. Yeah, definitely. All right, man, thank you so much for coming down today. This, As I said, I've been so fucking pumped to do this one. Um, I know it's been, you know, there's been hurdles and challenges to get you here, but I really appreciate you sitting down. I appreciate the nice things you said about me because that's not what I was expecting, but I fucking love that. And then second to that, dude, keep fucking killing it because everyone's watching from from Melbourne, back from back home, and where we're celebrating you. And without people like you, the next generation can't do it. Yeah, and thank you for sharing your story with me today. I appreciate that. I needed that kick. I got to keep going, and it's a constant grind. So before I finish, when do you go back on tour? Uh, tomorrow. Okay, and hopefully maybe you can come back and call Melbourne home again. Yeah, one day. Legend. Thanks, Thanks, bro. Thanks, Danny.